This is um, for the next about three weeks. Um, it's not a, it's, it's, I don't know if it's a tough subject. It's not something that I teach on regularly at all, by no means. And I don't want to make, make it more than it is. But it's, it's, a, it's a very important topic to speak about. And, um, you know, deception would never reach its goal if it wasn't so deceiving. And sometimes it's very hard to decipher deception. It's very hard to decipher the truth from the lie. And the only way to do that is to kind of expose it. But I just want you to know, um, listen, this is going to be a very important subject. So really, if you have little kids, please. There's a, there's a room in the back with a screen and coffee. This is, this is a very intense subject. It's something that I've wrestled with all week long, praying and fasting and crying. And, um, but I just want you to know that my emotion won't be, it won't be too emphatic because I don't want you to get the wrong idea that I'm, I'm angry. I'm, I'm not angry. It's history. But you have to know your history because history has a way of repeating itself. And you want to be on the right side of things. So... Um, it's kind of part of Purim, and next week our Torah Pasha will be all part of this. God just planned it out that way. Um, although God's name is not explicitly in the book of Esther, you know, it's not mentioned, his presence and his power are clearly manifested throughout as he provides deliverance for his people through a series of what a lot of Bible scholars call designed coincidences. Some people will even say divine coincidences. I say God incidences. At any rate, although the majority of the Jewish people remained in Persia, you might not know, but only 5% returned after the exile. It's not advertised. You have to read history. So that means 95% stayed. Why did 95% stay? The same reason why the Jews are staying in America. It's just a lot easier. Why trek through the desert and the Persian desert to get back to Israel when they're going back to something that's devastated? People like ease and people like comfort, I'm here to tell you that's going to change, so prepare yourself. Some people are getting nervous. Why are you nervous? Is the Lord not your shepherd? It's going to be great to see the legitimacy and the power and presence of God. I can't wait. So although the majority of Jewish people remained in Persia, they were still his chosen people. And he would protect them from the anti-Semitism which sought to exterminate them. Now, of course, you're familiar with the four main characters in the book of Esther. You have King Ashaverus, which was a king in search of a bride. He had Esther, the Jewish, that's a female Jewish person chosen to be queen, Mordecai, a proud Jew who works in the king's palace, and of course Haman, the king's chief servant. Now let me give you some, I, I don't like to spiritualize. Let me tell you what spiritualization is. A lot of people do it. They take what's literal, and they take what is interpretive, and then they get some revelation from God, and they tell everybody about it. But usually, 99 out of 100 times, that revelation is for you personally to apply to your life. That's why you see it a certain way, right? And then you ever notice, you see it, and it, it light bulb goes off. And God, through the power of his Holy Spirit, is telling you something for you individually. And what do you do? You get so excited that you run out and tell somebody, and they look at you like they don't know what you're talking about. And do you know why they look at you that way, sweet pea? Because it wasn't for them in the first place. You're casting pearls before swine. So what you need to do is when you get these revelations, 99 out of 100 times, they're not for the public. So I don't want to spiritualize because it's dangerous. I like to interpret scripture. However, I want to give you some representation that I saw. And, and if it's not, if it's something that doesn't resonate, you just let it go. Just let it go. Okay, the king, King Ashavirus, represents to me King Messiah. God's authority on earth. What he says goes. Queen Esther represents the faithful remnant of believers separated from the nations and chosen to be the king's bride. 
Mordecai typifies all the Jews throughout history who refused to bow down to anyone or anything other than the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Haman represents the spirit of anti-Semitism, or more importantly, the spirit of the Antichrist. Now, we see, I'm sure, you see the prophetic picture of the king and his bride. We know that in the last days after the tribulation, the king will come and he will marry his bride and we will celebrate the wedding feast of the Lamb, correct? That's a, no, that's a no-brainer to see. In fact, if you look at Esther's beautification, that's what's going on for us right now, guys. We are betrothed to the Lord, and we're going through a beautification process, better known in theological circles as sanctification, and God is removing our blemishes and our spots and our wrinkles, not from the outside, but from the inside. It's a sad fact. Listen to me. I know this might sting, but in today's society, we are so external. Amen. Mommy, how do I look? Mommy, how do I look? Mommy, how do I look? And nobody talks about character. Amen. Beauty is so fleeting. Guys, beauty is fleeting. But a woman of valor who can find beauty comes and goes, look at me. I used to look like Fabio. <laughs> Ask Bernadette. I mean... T to be perfectly frank, Bernadette was asked out by Fabio in the city at a gym. He asked her out, and I'm so glad that he did not marry her because then my children would have been like, pass the butter. <laughs> but beauty is, is fleeting. And when God speaks about spots and wrinkles, he's talking about on the inside of our hearts and our soul. I mean, some of us spent more time in front of the mirror getting ready for Shabbat than we did spending time with the Lord. It's a sad state of affairs. And unless you, you look at these truths, nothing will change. Nothing will change. So we see the prophetic picture, yes, between the king and her bride, especially her being Jewish. We know that God's going to come and save the Jews at the end. They'll look upon him and look upon him as one who mourns, and they'll be saved, and they'll marry the king, right? And they go off on the white horse and live happily ever after, and for those grafted in. But do we really see the ongoing struggle between Mordecai and the Hamans over the centuries? It's not as obvious, but that's what I want to focus on. The Jewish people desperately need to be healed of their spiritual blindness regarding Messiah Yeshua. It's a very hard witness. I spend a ton of time. My, you've got to understand, my whole family is Jewish. My mother was Jewish. My father was Jewish. My three sisters married three Jewish men. All their children were raised in the synagogue. It's not like, you know, my great-grandmother had a piece of matzo once. And then the neighborhood I lived in, in the Bronx, a lot of the older people that stayed there because they were fixed income, they were all Jewish. And I grew up in an area in New York City that was predominantly Jewish. So I know what it is to be around Jewish people. I know what it is raised to be raised in strict Judaism. I was orthodox. So they need to be healed desperately. But the church needs to repent of its long-standing bigotry towards the Jewish people. After I finish these three weeks, you'll never, ever again ask me, why don't the Jewish people believe? You'll see why. Let's look at some scripture from the book of Esther, Esther 3, 1 through 5. It says, Sometimes, la Sometime later, King Ashaverus began to single out Haman, the son of Hamdatta, the Agagai, for advancement. Eventually, he gave him precedence over all his fellow officers. All the king's servants at the king's gate would kneel and bow down before Haman because the king had so ordered. But Mordecai would neither kneel nor bow down to him. The king's servants at the king's gate asked Mordecai, quote, why don't you obey the king's order? End quote. But after they had confronted him a number of times without his paying attention to them, they told Haman in order to find out whether Mordecai's explanation that he was a Jew would suffice to justify his behavior. Haman was furious when he saw that Mordecai was not kneeling and bowing down to him. Mordecai was not trying to be disrespectful. It was proper in that time, in that era, to show respect and pay homage, but not in worship, and that's what Mordecai was looking for. Basically, he was saying, hey, man. <laughs> 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 
no can do. I'm a Jew. And it's just that simple. So many Jews went to the gas chambers and the torture chambers because they wouldn't bow down. Praise God for them, for they maintain the oracles of the word of God. <laughs> Romans 3 tells us if they didn't, if they gave in, if they assimilated, we would not have our Bible. If they gave in and assimilated, we would not be monotheistic. And if they gave in and assimilated, we would not have Messiah, for salvation is of the Jews. You might say, but Rabbi, you're a Jew, right? No, I'm a believer, and I'm here to give you the truth. If you see me as a Jew, it just shows that you're more racist than you realize. Haman was loved by the king. Loved. And although Haman continued to do the king's will, respect the king, his hatred of Mordecai blinded him of the king's will concerning Mordecai and his people. The church has produced many wonderful godly saints throughout history. But when it comes to dealing with the Jewish people, most Christians know little of God's will and plan for Israel. You say, well, we didn't learn it, Rabbi. Maybe you should have spent more time in the word of God than going to church. Maybe instead of running to the church, you should have ran to Yeshua. He said, come to me, not come to the waters of baptism. Some of you go to service after service after service, waiting to hear that next song that's going to change your life. Being in the presence of God, that's the fullness of joy. And you don't need to run to a facility to find that. Every morning I have that. Let's take a look at an all very important section of Scripture, just two verses in Romans 11. If you know the book of Romans, it's the quintessential theological book for Gentile believers, Christians. Um, but when it gets to Romans 9, it talks about Israel's past. When it gets to Romans 10, it talks about Israel's present. And Romans 11 talks about Israel's future. And somehow, after Romans 8, there is no condemnation for those who are in Messiah Yeshua. The church skips over these three chapters and goes right into Romans 12. Therefore, present yourself a living sacrifice. How did they do this? Listen to me, guys. I'm not angry at the church. I'm going to preach at a church today. I love my Christian brothers and sisters. But the truth will set you free. How did they gloss over? My enemy doesn't have a social security number. There's no person in this world that is my enemy. My enemy is Satan. And sadly enough, he knows how to infiltrate almost anybody. Let's look at Romans 11, 17 through 18. You should probably read the whole chapter. You should probably read the whole letter in one sitting. But nevertheless, I have two verses for you. It says, but if some of the branches were broken off, and you, a wild olive, were grafted in among them, and have become equal sharers in the rich root of the olive tree, then don't boast as if you were better than the branches. However, if you do boast... Remember that you are not supporting the root. Now, you might say, I've never seen it like this. Well, then it's good you hear. Without being arrogant, it's good you hear. It says, if some of the branches, who are the branches? We'll get into the words in a minute, but who are the branches? The Jewish people. But do you see it says, some do you know how many Jews, hundreds of thousands of Jews believed in the first century, guys? You don't know your history, sadly enough. First of all, the whole church was Jewish until Cornelius came along, and he totally assimilated into the Commonwealth of Israel. The word Christian wasn't even used until Antioch, way into Acts. I don't think there's anything wrong with it, but no, no, the, if you don't know the root, you will not receive the rich sap that the olive tree has to offer you. Don't you see that the power that was in the church in Acts is not the power that you see in the church today? The churches are prettier today. The buildings are more beautiful. The bands, they play incredibly well. The air conditioning works great. You got coffee shops and bookstores. You've got guys in the pulpit. They're very eloquent. They're very entertaining. 
but the anointing and the power of the Holy Spirit, it's history. Find out how many people are going to be delivered. Find out how many people are going to be raised from the dead. Find out how many people are going to be healed. No offense, but a ministry like Benny Hinn, I'm just telling you, that he did not have one documented medical miracle. Not one in the history of his ministry. Can't prove it to this day. Where did this go, guys? I have my opinion. Maybe I'll get to it. So the branches of the Jewish people, some were broken off. And you, who's you? Who? This is not derogatory. Gentile is not a derogatory saying. It just means of the nations. It just means non-Jewish bi biology. Look at the scriptures, guys. Don't fight with me. If you want to fight with the scripture, then you're fighting with God. It's a losing battle. You will lose that battle every time. But you, a wild olive, was grafted in among them. Them is who? Jewish people. And have become equal sharers. Join heirs. No more is there Jew and Gentile. Somebody should freaking say hallelujah. <laughs> equal shares in the rich root of the olive tree. What's the olive tree? What is the root of the olive tree? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's the root. That's where it started. After the Tower of Babel, guys. Genesis 11, then Genesis 12, it started with Abraham. And then Abraham had a son of promise, Isaac. And Isaac gave birth to Jacob, who was the next son of promise. And Jacob gave birth to 12 branches called the 12 tribes. And one of those tribes gave birth to Yeshua the Messiah. That's the lineage. That's your lineage. And he says, don't boast. Why are you boasting? Why are you speaking about replacement? Why do you think you're better? He's telling you, Paul, the great Paul, in the letter of Romans to Gentile believers, don't boast, guys, like you're better than the branches. But if you do boast, if you, if you have to, because, you know, it's hard. Human beings love to boast, even when they do it humbly. He says, but if you have to, keep in mind the roots supporting you. Yeah. Now let's just look at a few words so you can see what I'm telling you is true. And we'll look it up in the Greek because the New Testament was written in Greek, so we have to look these words up in the Greek lexicon. There's no way around it. Branches, young tend to shoot, broken off for grafting. This is the textbook Greek definition. This is not mine. A branch as the Jewish patriarchs are likened to the root. Remember what I told you? Stay with me. Because you need to explain this, see. You can't keep giving out my tapes. Because someday they might confiscate them. You need to know this. Especially if you're part of a Messianic community. I need your help. You've got to put this on social media. You've got to talk to people. Talk to your pastor if you still go to church. Help us out. The, the roots, according to the definition, are Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The branches, the posterity, means their offspring. The offspring of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are the 12 tribes of Israel. Okay? Next definition, olive tree is an olive tree. The wild olive is not an olive tree. Let me show you. I really needed to show you this. Look at the difference. That's an olive tree. That's an oleaster. The olive tree is wind pollinated, which is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. It's drought resistant, which is symbolic of its strength and fortitude. You can cut a branch off and a hundred years later a shoot will come out. 1948. Look at the oleaster. It's got no hope. But I, I don't know if you've ever known this. This is really, I shared this with somebody yesterday. And they said, I never heard this. And I thought, golly, is this, you never heard this? Like, I thought everybody knew this. So I'm going to throw this out there, and if I'm wasting your time, forgive me. But do you know what goes on in natural agriculture? In natural agriculture, the branch from the good tree, the olive tree, yeah. would be inserted yeah. into the bad tree. 
Does anybody know that? So in other words, let's just, let's just say here, I really like this, so, so I'm going to get a little excited. If there are 10 branches on the olive tree, and there are 10 branches on the oleaster, and the oleaster is a dead tree, and the olive tree is a live tree, and I took a branch off the good tree and grafted into the bad tree, is there any increase? No. No, I removed the branch. There was 10 branches. Now I have nine. And I insert it into that dead tree, and it'll, they'll have some life from that one branch. So nine and one is 10. There's no increase. But God didn't do the natural thing. He did the supernatural thing. Why? Because he's supernatural. So he took all the dead branches and inserted them into the good tree, and, in, and there was increase. But the olive tree didn't become part of the wild olive. The wild olive became part of the olive tree. Therefore, the wild olive didn't replace Israel. The wild olive didn't improve Israel. The wild olive didn't change Israel. The wild olive enlarged Israel. You are part of Israel. And although this is not taught today at any church, it was taught 2,000 years ago. And guess what? I'm not going to go with Pastor Bob or Pastor Bill or Pastor Jerry. I'm going to go with Pastor Paul on this one. Because I have a feeling he might be a little bit more anointed than most of the pastors in America. Do you see that? The supernatural thing. That's unbelievable. That's why you have to get to the rich root. I call it olive tree theology. But today we have Christmas tree theology. It's a whole nother tree. You ever look at a Christmas tree? It is beautiful. It really is. It's evergreen, so it looks like it has life, right? The evergreen speaks about eternal life. And the lights speak to the Holy Spirit. And the star speaks to the Messiah. And if you look at the tree, it's very warm and beautiful. But look down at the bottom of the tree. It's cut off from its root, and it's slowly dying. And that's why we have a lot of drama today. A lot of drama and no power. A lot of hoopla and no legitimate power. Look at Romans 11, 17, 18 one more time. If some of the branches were broken off and you, a wild olive, were grafted in among them and have become equal sharers, that's good news. Listen, why didn't the disciples speak to any Gentiles about Messiah? Because Jesus told them not to. He said, don't go the way of the Gentiles. Remember the Canaanite woman who said, come on, help me out, man. And he said, you want me to take bread? from my own, and give it to you, a dog? You know how disgraceful that is to kind of say that to somebody? And what did she say? Hey, even a dog should get a few crumbs. Man, that's a humble woman of faith, not an arrogant person in pride. There's so much Christian pride that doesn't even know what they've been rooted into. And they have their own tree and their own, it's crazy. God took down the wall. There was a wall in the synagogue. The Gentiles couldn't go behind it. God took down the wall, and you're letting Satan build it back up, and you're handing him bricks. Satan freaked out, guys. Uh-uh, the two are one. I can't have this. These pagan Gentiles are going to start to celebrate God's feasts. They're going to start to, and so what did he do? Uh-uh, he freaked out. He had an emergency meeting. Start building the wall. You, Saturday, you, Sunday, pass some laws. Get Sunday laws. You, pot roast, you, pork loin. You, Passover tabernacles, you, Christmas and Easter. And he built the wall. And guess what I'm doing? Trying to tear it down. And every time I pull a brick down, somebody else puts 10 more on. So I need your help, man. I need your help. If you do both, remember that you are not supporting the root. The root is supporting you. Look at the word root. A shoot, metaphorically offspring, the root. 
the offspring of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the children of Israel, the Jewish people. Paul warns the Gentiles not to take a holier-than-thou attitude towards the Jews or boast about any superiority. Any such boasting overlooks the fact that they didn't originate the line of privilege. Rather, it is the line of privilege that put them where they are in a place of special favor. Truth be told, over the centuries, Christians have not only boasted against the natural branches, but they've often trampled them underfoot. Look at Haman's frustration in 5.9 of Esther. That day, Haman went out. He was just at a banquet, right? With the queen. Who does she invite? Her husband, of course, the king. And Haman, that's it. Two people. There was millions, millions of people in Shushan and the surrounding territories. And the queen has a party, and she invites her husband, of course. And Haman, he's feeling it. The guy had massive pride. And he is inflated right now. And he's in good spirits. But when Haman saw Mordecai at the king's gate, imagine that. His joy was taken from him. Just like Satan, every time Satan hears a Jew say, Baruch HaBab Hashem and Roy, he loses it. He hates me. He knows we'll tell everybody. We're not just going to sit with our Christian t-shirts and hang out in a building. We tell everybody, man. We'll witness the farm animals. He saw Mordecai at the gate, and then he neither rose nor moved. Haman was infuriated. Look at this word. This is so telling, guys. I love the Bible. It's so, it's, there's so much to it. You don't, you don't need these other books. Chema. What did they do 2,000 years ago before there were books, guys? And they only had one book. Those guys dance circles around the theologians today. They dance circles around the men of God today. Dance circles. Were they as eloquent? No. Were they as funny? No. Were they as good looking? Probably not. But man, they were holy men on fire, filled with the Holy Spirit. Rage and wrath, figuratively venom or poison. The word means venom or poison. Who shoots venom and poison? A serpent. What are we speaking about here? Haman had the spirit of the Antichrist, and he was shooting venom from his father, Satan himself. The Antichrist is the son of Satan. Genesis 3.15, I'll have enmity between you, the woman Israel, and you, Satan, her seed and your seed. Her seed is the Messiah. Your seed is the anti-Messiah. Why was Satan always trying to kill the Jews? No Jews, no Jesus. Get it through your thick head. The spirit of the anti-Semitism is not just the spirit of the Antichrist. Jew hatred is Christ hatred. Rabbi, how could that be? Because Satan is really good at what he does, sweet pea. He's so good. Look at this. You don't even have to go back in history. This is 1990. There was a guy, John Strugnell, a devout card-carrying Catholic. He was on the committee to supervise the Dead Sea Scrolls when they found them. 1990, a Jewish reporter in Israel, Avi Kutzman, he wrote this in Biblical Archaeology, but I don't want you to think, well, Avi Kutzman, he's a Jew. It was also reported in the New York Times, 1991, when the New York Times was a good paper, by the way. 1990, a Jewish reporter in Israel interviewed John Strugnell, a Catholic, who was at that time the chief editor of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Strugnell called Judaism a horrible religion. He's saved because of that horrible religion. This is a brilliant man. And described himself as an anti judaist which I like. Call it for what it is. Stop saying anti-Semitism. A Semite isn't just a Jew. A Semite could be an Arab. Call it for what it is. Jew hatred. That's what they called it in Germany in the 1800s. Judenhaus. But you know what? It wasn't politically correct, so they went with anti-Semitism. You know what I mean? It's like, I'm just having an affair. No, you're committing adultery. anti judaist I'm a Jew hater. When asked what annoyed him about Judaism, Strugnell replied, quote, the fact that it has survived when it should have disappeared. You Jews, imagine, are a phenomena. Yes, because the God of the Jews is a phenomena. Get with the program. Who's your God? Is it the God of the Jews or the God of the Muslims? Is he the king of, king of Israel or the king of Macon? 
You Jews are a phenomenon that we haven't managed to convert, and we should have managed. You would have managed, knucklehead, if you would have told them the right things, that they could have stayed Jewish. But you didn't. You forced this faith on them, and it's not even a faith that God honors. Look at Esther 5.14. At this, Suresh, here he is. He's having the time of his life at the party. He leaves the party. He's feeling great. But, you know, he's like, I don't know. He's, he's a wuss for an antichrist. He's so upset. And his wife and his friends tell him, look. Make some gallows, 75 feet high, so everybody can see it. It's 25 yards. And in the morning, speak to the king and have Mordecai hang on it. So look how matter of fact this is. It's just, he's just a Jew. That's what people felt like for centuries. They're just Jews. They're not real people. Then go in and enjoy yourself with the king at the back. Just have the thing said. Tell the king and then have a few drinks. Lighten up. It's no big deal. Heartless. Demonic. That's what it is. Call it for what it is. Haman liked the idea. Good idea, sweetie. So he had the gallows made. The church, for centuries, constructed a theological gallows to justify torturing, burning, and hanging Jews on literal gallows. Christian leaders like Justin Martyr, John Chrysostom, and St. Augustine were noble saints. But the Christian roots of anti-Semitism must be exposed for the church and the Jews to be reconciled. The first church split happened in the first century when the Gentiles seceded from the congregations. They started to plant their own trees. And they de-Judaized the faith. And we lost the rich root and the Jewishness of the gospel. Justin Martyr was an early Christian apologist. He lived from 100 to 165. Now some of you are going to hear this and say, no, I, I really like him. You don't know him. Because if you did, you wouldn't say that. And some of you might have operated, raised in a certain religion. Listen, it does not mean that you're that person. It does not mean that you're responsible but you can't deny your history. You have to know your history. I had a guy read this, and he wrote to me this morning and said, Rabbi, I can't stop crying. I never knew. I'm so sorry. Beautiful. You got it. Beautiful. You just did it. You kind of vicariously repented. That's all you can do. You can't change it. And then you can go forward and stand up and be a voice against it if it should ever happen again. He lived from 100 to 100, an apologist, somebody who defends the faith. He's regarded as the foremost interpreter of all time of the theory of the Logos. He's considered a saint in Roman Catholicism. He's considered a saint in the Anglican Church. And he's considered a saint in the Eastern Orthodox Church. This was his dialogue with Trifo. Now, why did he have a dialogue with Trifo? He, he was born in Samaria. He was born in Israel, basically. But he knew nothing about the Old Testament. And he didn't know Hebrew. And he was an anti-Semite. Look at this discussion he has with this Jew, 138 through 161. That not one of you be permitted to enter your city, Jerusalem. Where are we? That's not it. Yeah, yeah, you got to start with the first screen, right? We too would observe your circumcision of the flesh, your Sabbath days. You see it? You see, the only way you know you're Jewish, because back then only Jews got circumcised according to the Abrahamic covenant in Genesis 15. The Sabbath wasn't implemented with the law. It was implemented in Genesis 2. And the dietary laws, Leviticus 11. I was in Memphis, the oldest barbecue house in the United States of America. I just asked, hey, do you have any beans without pork? The owner came running out and said, you're a Jew, aren't you? See? And I said, are you a religious man? He goes, no, I'm secular. A secular man knew it. I'm supposed to be identified because what I am is a testimony to the goodness and greatness of God that he has not forgot his people, he has not divorced his bride, and he will never forget you. Our longevity is your security. It's nothing I did to be saved. I'm saved by the same grace of God you are.
but I have to be identified. And if I join a church, my identification is history. Bernadette's mother was Jewish. My kids are three-quarters Jewish. How are they going to live their identity in a church? I love the church, but it won't work. So I say to the church, I'm not telling you you have to do this, but don't you dare tell me I can't. I'm not a cult leader for observing the days of God. I would more question your days. Where did they come from? Do your research. We would observe your circumcision, your Sabbath days, and in a word, all your festivals, Levitical holidays, if we were not aware of the reason why they were imposed upon you, namely because of your sins and the hardness of heart. So that's why God gave. See how little he knows? God gave them the festivals to impose upon them a mark of disgust. They're called the Lord's festivals. This guy was infiltrated by the enemy at this point. There's no, there's no, way, there's no way around it. There's no way around it. The custom of circumcising the flesh handed down from Abraham was given to you as a distinguishing mark to set you off from the other nations and from us Christians. See the separation? See what Satan's doing? Using him to build a wall. Guys, don't get fooled, man. This is so blatant. You look confused. Denial's not just a river in Egypt. Really, embrace the truth for God's sakes. The truth will set you free. The purpose of this was that you and only you might suffer the afflictions that you are now justly yours. I mean, it's your fault because you're Jewish. That only your land be desolated and your cities ruined by fire, that the fruits of your land be eaten by strangers before your very eyes. Let's continue. That not one of you be permitted to enter your city, Jerusalem, which happened. 135, a million Jews were killed. Your circumcision of the flesh is the only mark by which you can certainly be distinguished from other men. As I stated before, it was by reason of your sins and the sins of your fathers that among other precepts, God imposed upon you the observance of Sabbath as a mark. He's held in high regard. I mean, as far as his theology on the logos, they say nobody matches him. Then there's John Chrysostom. He lived 349 to 407. John Chrysostom, that wasn't his real name. Chrysostom means golden mouth. Because his eloquence was impeccable. He was the Archbishop of Constantinople and a very important church father. He was known for his preaching and public speaking. And he was one of the most prolific authors in the early Christian church, exceeded only by Augustine of Hippo. Look what he wrote in The Roots of Christian Anti-Semitism by Malcolm Hay. This is a direct quote from his writings. The synagogue is worse than a brothel. It is the den of scoundrels and the repair of wild beasts, the temple of demons devoted to idolatrous cults, the refuge of brigands, those are, that's a fancy word I told you, he was a golden mouth, thieves, and debauchees, sexually moral, and the cavern of devils. It is a criminal assembly of Jews, a place of meeting for the assassins of Christ, a house worse than a drinking shop, a den of thieves, a house of ill fame, a dwelling of iniquity, the refuge of devils, a gulf and an abyss of perdition, hell. I would say the same things about their souls as for me. I hate the synagogue. I hate the Jews for the same reason. This guy was the guy who taught the world Christianity, the Western world. Do you think that might have an influence? If I tell my kids, stay away from, and I name a certain people, and I keep telling them how awful they are, do you think they might stay away? Do you see the influence that Satan was able to manifest through some of these great men of God? Now, I told you the only other one that was also the greatest is St. Augustine, 354 to 430, early Christian theologian and philosopher from Numidia, which is Mande, Algeria. His, his writings totally influenced the development of Western Christianity. He's viewed as the most important church father, and from Confessions 1214, look at what he said, and I quote, how hateful to me are the enemies of your scripture. How I wish that you would slay the Jews with your two-edged sword. See how it's progressing? <laughs> so that there should be none to oppose your word. Gladly would I have them die to themselves and live to you. Listen. There were some things they did that were beautiful. And what, what they're saying here does not negate those things. You follow? They're two separate columns. But some of the beautiful things they did does not negate this horror. You have to separate the two. 
Martin Luther, uh, the old time worst. Now, just, just a couple of months ago, the American church held him in the highest regard for the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. I, I just sat and wondered, how could these great men of God not know the history? He lived 1483 to 1546. He's the most extreme example in the history of a Jew lover who turned into a Jew hater when the Jews refused to accept his theology. Luther, of course, is primarily known as the Catholic monk who revolted against the Vatican and founded the breakaway faith that became the Lutheran Church. During his role's early years, Luther was sure he would accomplish what the Catholic Church had failed to do, and that was to bring a large number of Jews to Christianity. Toward the end, in 1523, he wrote a pamphlet that Jesus was born a Jew. Listen to this. He was a Jew lover. Look what he said. And if I had been a Jew and had seen such idiots and blockheads ruling and teaching the Christian religion, I would have rather been a pig than a Christian. He's talking about how people dealt with the Jewish people. Anybody familiar with blood libel? Blood libel or the blood accusation is the superstitious accusation that Jews sacrifice Christian children at Passover to obtain the blood to make matzah. People believed it. They still do. It started in the 12th century. I know. Hard to believe, right? But it's also hard to believe that beautiful Christians think that Jesus was Jewish. What is he now? Pentecostal? <laughs> Luther fought the blood libel. He taught that it was slander. He spoke it to everybody and blamed the church for alienating the Jews. That's when he wrote this. He was passionate about the elimination of anti-Jewish legislation. Yet... 20 years later, 20 years, the same man who was so pro-Jewish was able to pen the most anti-Semitic writings produced in Germany until the time of Hitler. Incessed that the Jews had not followed his brand of Christianity, Luther outlined eight actions to take against the Jews. One, burn all the synagogues. So they started burning synagogues. He was the Protestant reformer. Two, destroy all Jewish homes. So they destroy the homes. Why? Because they know they read their holy books in their homes more than they do at the synagogue. Confiscate all Jewish holy books. Take away every Torah from them. Four, forbid rabbis to teach. If I was teaching, I would have to die. Criminal offense. Five, forbid Jews to travel. Six, confiscate all their property. Seven, force Jews to just do physical labor. They became slaves. And eight, in case the preceding restrictions proved insufficient, kill them. Look at what he wrote just 20 years later from Of the Unknowable Name and the Generations of Christ, 1543. Even if they were punished in the most gruesome manner, that the streets ran with their blood, that their dead would be counted, not in the hundreds of thousands, but in the millions, as happened under Vespian, that was the first century in Jerusalem where they killed about a million Jews, and under evil Hadrian, 135, still they must insist on being right, even after these 1,500 years that they were in misery, another 1,500 years, in some they are the devil's children, damned to hell. They just celebrated him, right? Look what he wrote in the Jewish mystique. Look at this. The Jews are just devils and nothing more. Martin Luther said that if a Jew came to him for baptism, he would, quote, tie a millstone about his neck and cast him into the river in the name of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'm just wondering, how do you think Jesus felt about these writings, being that he adores his people and he's coming back to fight for them in the last days? Just, just one more, and we'll, we'll finish up for today because it's, it's a lot. There's a lot I have to go over. I have to go over the Torah, why it's not taught, what, what is it. There's a lot I have to go over. There's a lot I have to try to deprogram and, and change. Um, but look at what John Calvin said. You familiar with John Calvin? Churches today, churches have split over him. People ask me, what do you think about John Calvin? I say, I don't. <laughs> and not just because he was a total anti-Semite, because I could care less about his theology. I get my theology from the Word. Where do you get yours from? A response to questions and objections of a certain Jew by Gon Calvin. There, the Jews, rotten and unbending stiff neckedness, deserves that they be oppressed unendedly and without measure or end, and they would die in their misery and without the pity of anyone. What if I said the, the Mexicans, rotten and unbending stiff, what if I said that today? What do you think would happen to me? Or the blacks, or the, why is it okay if we say the Jews? Why does it just go over our heads? I don't know, Lord. It seems so demonic. 
Unfortunately, these anti-Semitic ravings were not peripheral jottings of Luther or Calvin. They became well known throughout Germany. 400 years later, Hitler proudly claimed Luther as an ally, a dear friend. And he said, quote, Luther saw the Jew as we are only beginning to see him today. He gave birth to the Holocaust. Um, guys, I, I don't do this often. I, I hate doing it. I, I don't get mad. I get sad. I get sad about any oppression. I get sad about any persecution. You know, it wasn't just six million people, Jews, that died. There were six million others that died in the Holocaust. You know, Roman gypsies, about a half a million and so on. Um, it amazes me, though, that somebody can love Jesus with all their heart and love the word and yet be totally ambivalent to the people that brought them the very word and the Messiah that saved them. Do I have a vested interest? Yes. I have a vested interest to glorify God and talk to you and give you the truth so you would walk in the light Thank you, Rabbi. and that you would be able to decipher the truth from a lie. And so in the end days when deception comes on and many come in his name, you won't be that one that gets hoodwinked and says, but I went to church, I tithe, I read my Bible. And he says, I don't know you. There's not many that got on the ark, guys. Don't think the numbers are accurate. Um, next week, we're going to start talking about two things, supersessionism and translated responsibility. These are the two church teachings that became the foundation stones for centuries of oppression by the church. Supersessionism, replacement theology. It's real simple. People want to write books about it. You don't have to. It's the belief that God has rejected the Jews unilaterally canceled the covenants with them and now favors the Christian as new chosen people. Now, you might think that's not that dangerous. Do you know what the Muslims are? They're replacement theological. In 632, Muhammad declared that he replaced the Christians. See how hoodwinked? I mean, we hate them, but yet we're doing kind of what they did, just more loving. We're not killing anybody, not physically anyway. And then translate a responsibility, holding all Jews from the first century onward responsible for Jesus' execution. It's called deicide. It was preached by the Catholic Church for centuries. They killed and murdered and tortured Jews because of that. And only Pope John XXIII, the only pope that I really kind of had respect for, started Vatican Council II. He was raised to the papacy in 1958. His name was Joseph Roncalli. And he was known as Pope John, and he just wept when he thought about the Good Friday prayer, deliver these perfidious Jews. And he thought about all that the Catholic Church did, and he came to a bunch of rabbis on his knees, and he said, please forgive us for all these years of persecution. We've crucified Jesus Christ a second time. He got it. You can't do anything about it. But you can confess it, you can vicariously repent, and you can never, ever let anybody get away with it again. Let's stand together. Now I've got to get a flight to Memphis, and their conference is called No Greater Love. How's that for a switch? <laughs> yep, yep. It's all right. Like I told you guys, I'm not angry. I'm not. I'm so happy I'm saved. You have no idea. I thank God every morning for my salvation. You ask Bernadette how many times she comes downstairs and I'm just weeping in God's presence because I'm so thankful that he reinstated me in that olive tree. And we have to be heralds of truth. Even if it's a voice crying in the wilderness, even if it means you lose your head over it, better speak the truth and lose your head than speak with a forked tongue and keep it. That's what I say. So may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Prince of all peace, Yeshua.
Hono velecha, v'yasem lecha, shalom. I love you guys. Shabbat shalom.